Hello and welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. Excited to have Luigi Amante here with us today, Chief Operations Officer at Agent Image and August 99. Luigi, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Excellent. And for those audience members that aren't familiar, uh, could you share a bit about your background and formation of Agent Image in August 99? Sure. Um, uh, my background. So I graduated as an electrical engineer, um, and I did that for about a year till I got laid off. I worked for uh, GE, uh, General Electric, as a electrical engineer with them. Um, and then, uh, you know, the office that I happened to be in uh, wasn't making money, so they shut that office down, and I got laid off. And uh, a friend of mine who I went to high school with, he started a uh, web design business. Uh, he started in 1999. Uh, and that's why the other business is called August 99. And uh, we were playing beach volleyball. And he's like, hey, man, why don't you just, you know, help me out with this business? And, you know, he had must have been eight months in at that time. And, uh, yeah, and kind of the rest is history. The, the business officially is called The Design People. And uh, because of his ties in real estate and my other business partner's ties in real estate, uh, we were working in the real estate industry for a while. And then, so what we decided to do was create uh, a second brand or a second business called H and Image, um, because originally the design people was supposed to be kind of a boutique web design firm. Um, but what happened was H and Image was the thing that blew up and became really big. Um, and so H and Image is really our, our main business at this point. And then August '99, um, you know, we've got a bunch of businesses in the Philippines, um, and you know, part of it is also supporting H and Image. Um, but, you know, my business partner likes to call it uh, our business as a business of startups. So we've got a bunch of things always cooking in the pot at all times. But our main business, um, you know, the ones that, you know, our biggest one is, is Agent Image. And Agent Image, uh, what we do there is we do websites and, and marketing for uh, real estate agents and offices, um, primarily in North America. But, you know, we're starting to do websites, you know, across the globe, like the UK, Europe. Um, South America, things like that. That's it. And we've been in business so since '99. Hmm? There you go. Very nice. So, moved past the world of engineering, got involved with real estate, saw the need for websites, branding, various design assets, and working with your partner who started in August of '99. Right. And, uh, you know, from there, we're able to build an entire book of business, an entire portal. Uh, if you will, for agent image. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, what we're really known for is our design work and customization. Um, you know, we, you know, it's only recently that we've started kind of submitting our, our, our client sites to uh, design awards. Uh, and, you know, the last couple of years we've been doing very, very well. And, and we're very fortunate to have the team that we have and, and the people that we have. Um, that That's kind of our, our big our big shtick is, is we, we do a lot of, you know, really nice design and, and custom work. And that's, you know, that, that's our, our, our team. And, and Tiger, who's my business partner, he's the one who thought of the idea. But his original idea was really to just do web design because this is August 99 and this was right during the Internet boom. So that was the original idea. But be, again, because of our ties with real estate, um, that's that's how Agent Image came to be. Basically focused on real estate yeah. at that point with those yeah once you started uh doing well and you know and we we just got so many clients I mean, we figured that's you know that's what we should focus our time and energy on excellent excellent now i hear websites but i know there's so much in the background there when you're working with a real estate agent does it begin at the branding stage you know logo style you know, whole brand image and then evolve into a website and additional uh, creative deliverables? Or is it primarily focused around their, their site? Right. Uh, for us, it's really websites. They come to us for a website and they're like, hey, can you do this? Can you do our logo? Can you do our SEO? Can you do our social media? But the real reason people come to us is uh, is our websites and, and, you know, mostly our the designs that we put out there. Because, really, you know, real estate websites are, you know, there's only so much that you can put put in there, um, especially for an individual agent or a small office. Um, so, you know, what what separates us from everybody else is really kind of the creativity that uh, we put in or that our team puts in on, on each and every website. Sure. 
Now, are most of the agents in, a, agents that you work with looking for listings, looking to sell properties? Is it a balance of both, or do they have a primary KPI, a key performance um, indicator? Obviously, everybody wants more business, right? Um, but the reason they come to us is because they want their online brand to be better than you know their competition, right? Uh, real estate is not an easy industry to be in. Um, you know, you've got an office full of real estate agents that are essentially vying for the same, same client base, right? And they're trying to get the same listing and they're trying to sell the same types of listings, right? So they're kind of, they're independent business owners and they've got a lot on their plate and they need something to differentiate them from everybody else. And that's what we're really good at is uh, making the, you know, a lot of our clients are actually on, you know, um, on TV. Um, so those guys are and girls are established brands. So, you know, we just need to make sure they look, um, you know, as established as they really are. And then what we can also do is have a new agent look like they're a million dollar agent. Right. And, and that's kind of what we do. Now is a larger percentage percentage of your business, more of those TV personality level real estate agents, no, no. or is it a blend with the newcomers as well? Uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I think the biggest differentiator with us is uh, we're not cheap um, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of manual labor involved with what we do. Uh, we actually create, you know, custom designs and what the common thing for our, I guess any web design industry is they'll just create a bunch of templates or themes and they'll just sell those um, because getting into the whole custom deal, you know, if, if you, if you ever met a graphic artist or you've ever had somebody known somebody's in commercial art, when you do custom work, it could, it could take a short time or it could take a super long time, depending on the client, depending on kind of how things work out. And a lot of people don't want to get into that because it's just, it's a tough, it's a tough gig. Um, you know, because sometimes you can get it right away and sometimes it'll take a really long time before, before you get it right. Sure. What, what are the typical engagement lengths? Is this uh, you know, one month, three months, four to six, depending on the product. Years? Yeah. Depending on the yeah. product. So we, we, we've got projects that, that are shorter, um, because those are kind of mostly pre-designed, uh, websites. And then we have got clients that are like, well, I want almost everything customized design wise. So those take much longer. It just really depends on, uh, you know, it could be a couple of weeks. It could be a couple of months, sometimes six months, you know, sometimes even more. It really just depends on the project and uh, what, what they ask us to do. Sure. Any type of strategy involved when building a site, meaning competitor audits, different components of their brand and recent sure. press? Um, yeah, it depends on the client. Um, you know, uh, we definitely go through an interview process with the client. Um, if we do their SEO and marketing, then we do a lot of competitor research, things like that, but that's standard with, with that type of, uh, product. Um, so yeah, again, it depends on which, uh, what the client's needs are and what they purchased. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that we provide that a lot of people don't is just like you can go, you know, it's like going to, um, I, I guess the best way to do it is like a, a designer for, for clothes. You can buy stuff off the rack, but you know, if you've got the, the time, patience and, and money, you can do something purely custom. Um, and not a lot of people will do that. Mom and pop shops will do it. Um, but you know, bigger companies, it's, it gets a little bit harder just purely because of the, uh, the man hours it takes to do it. And, you know, we've, you know, we've been fortunate to be able to do it even as we, as we grew. Excellent. Excellent. Now, where does mobile sit in all this these days? Is it mobile first when they're designing these sites? Are you guys doing any mobile apps? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, it, you know, everybody's on their, on their phones, right? And like uh, the first, generally, if you were to put in the number of hours you spend on your phone, I have to imagine it's gotta be at least 20, 30% of your day, if not more. Right. Um, so it's definitely mobile has to be a, a part of the conversation when you uh, create websites. Um, and so it, it's important. And so we, you know, we, we have to kind of always take that into consideration. Um, but we are also actually developing a, a, a new app. Um, and it's, you know, for mobile and for iPads. And it's, it, we call it a digital listing presentation. And the, uh, the product is, is called Access. 
and uh, we just released it uh, to a couple clients and they're beta testing it right now. And it's, um, you know, there, there are bigger applications for it, but uh, for the initial release, um, real estate agents, when they try to get a listing, they have a listing presentation. And so what we tried to do is create a, 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 an online, ver a digital version of that um, that uh, will help them get the listing. And once it's, it's done, then we'll, um, the other side of it is a digital open house uh, where now that they get the listing, now they got to kind of share it with everybody. And what we try to do is, you know, get the best technology that's out there and integrate it with our system and make it look really, really nice. And hopefully make a presentation that gets you your clients and helps you close deals and, and sell the houses. Absolutely. I can picture that format really shining. And uh, Yeah, like yeah, yeah. We're, because deals. we're, you know, we're the design people. Uh, you know, design, uh, that that's really what we want to do is just have a presentation that just really, you know, knocks people off their feet and, you know, hopefully gets you that uh, that deal and hopefully closes that sale as well. Um, so, and we deal with, again, we deal with a lot of high end, uh, agent, uh, brokerages and clients. So it has to be up to par with their branding and, and, you know, their image. Absolutely. Especially for those higher level properties that those brokerages and clients are involved right. with. Right. And, but it's not just for them. Um, you know, it's designed to be for everybody. Uh, we're really hoping that, um, you know, this becomes, again, hopefully this isn't too premature to say, it becomes kind of the de facto standard on how you do listing presentations, and how you do open houses, especially, you know, with COVID, it, the timing was, was really good because people, you know, didn't want to go into houses and do open houses. Um, you know, we were hoping to find a better way to kind of present, uh, do open houses without, with, without people having to physically um, go into the, go into the, the, the place. Sure. Looking for digital versions and that allows it to be more scalable, more individuals can have that same experience. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. What about your own marketing? How has Agent Image been able to position? Is this primarily through strategic partnerships, obviously the awards, but is it building relationships with different firms and brokerages, uh, right. more word of mouth, the successful agent works with you and they make referrals? How has uh, your positioning come to be? So we're a little bit different from other companies. Um, you know, the way we grew was we didn't go to the brokerages uh, and big companies direct. We went to, to the agents. And, uh, you know, my business partner, John, who's the, the president of Agent Image, he's the, he's the kind of the face of the company. One thing he likes to say is, you know, um, for the agent, by the agent. And that's kind of what happened, right? I mean, I think we just naturally went into it because those are the people we work with and those are people who who signed up to us directly. We didn't try to get these big deals with like a, a big brokerage who would there then push our services onto their agents. Um, instead, the agents went to us direct um, despite what their brokerages were trying to uh, get them to use um, just purely because of, you know, the, the quality of product that we would uh, put out there and the, you know, the, just how nice it, they looked, uh, how nice the designs look when, when they got them. So the, the work, the quality of it was really the strongest marketing tool for you as yeah. it started being shared by the agents, you got more inquiries. Right. Right. And obviously we've got a whole marketing team, um, and again, John, my business partner, is the president, but he also kind of uh, spearheads a lot of the marketing nowadays. It used to be, you know, Tiger and him and, you know, when we were smaller, but now he's kind of the one who manages that because Tiger's working on other businesses. Um, but he, you know, now we obviously do, you know, lead generation. We do, you know, we do a lot of uh, different things to try to get uh, leads into uh, um, the business. So, you know, beyond that, but, you know, Part of the reason why people buy with us is because of our, our work and our client base. That portfolio. Yep. Very nice. And uh, interesting to hear about the lead generation too, uh, imagining some, maybe some ad tests at some point, uh, yep. years back, or pre-COVID, more events and conferences. And Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we sponsor a lot of yeah. events. Um, but, you know, we used to go to every event. Uh, and we realized, you know, that 
it depends. It really like we had to pick and choose the events that we'd want to attend uh, to make sure that um, the people who were there um, understood the value of kind of what we brought to the table. Um, so some events we, you know, we, we didn't pursue and some we did because we thought that it just had, you know, it was it was more beneficial for us. Absolutely. We got to pick and choose. Uh, we did a lot of events uh, for a few years before COVID. Got some good traveling for it. But comparing one to the next and the amount of leads, the quality of the leads, as I keep hearing quality in your answers here and how much of a role that plays for your business. Yep. So uh, I imagine you guys have to be very selective. Yep. Yep, definitely. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we want to you know, trade shows are not cheap, right? Um, and right. just being, being, having a booth and sending people out there and, and spending a lot of, having your marketing team put in all kind of the material and, and whatever swag you want to give out, it's like, you just, you know, it's a lot of money, you know, and whatever advertising dollars you're going to spend, you might, you, you better be very clear about how you're going to spend it and make sure that you get, uh, you know, a good return on it. And it's, being sent to an audience that is in alignment with your business and kind of, you know, the type of clientele that works well with uh, the products that you, and services you're offering. Oh yeah. I'm a numbers guy. Our business development team has, you know, a quote of how many conversations to have at these conferences, quality of that takeaways. Uh, but, but really looking to measure it six months out. I mean, we still see business come in from conferences two, three years ago. So you're not trying to measure it too quick, but want to make sure it's productive. Because like you said, getting the team out there, just the time cost to it all uh, is, is, is quite a thing to wrap a head around. Yep. Yeah, 100% agree on that. Absolutely. So that's Age and Image. What, what's the distinction between Age and Image and August 99? Is that okay. more of, yes. Yeah, so August 99. Um, so we have our, our, our offices in the Philippines. The first thing we did was, um, you know, we supported, uh, that company supported Agent Image and, you know, the design people at the time. Um, and we opened that office in 2002, I think, or something like that. And um, it was really to support us, right? But one of the things we learned over time is like, well, you know, and then outsourcing became big. We were actually, in, when we did it in 2001 and 2002, we were like the fifth company to do uh, outsourcing, you know, uh, or they call it in the Philippines a BPO, business process outsourcing. And uh, it wasn't even a thing yet. And uh, as we grew, we're like, well, you know, we could potentially provide these services for other people, right? If they needed web design, programming, things like that. So our first uh, secondary business was was that, was creating, um, uh, you know, groups that can help support other companies who needed, you know, web work, programming, designing. Um, we even offer uh, assistance with, you know, if you need uh, customer service, things like that. So parts of our business, our business we could now, kind of offer um, as a service to, to, to other people. And that helps uh, obviously supplement income and offset costs and things like that. Very and nice. Now, yeah, and in August 99, again, Tiger calls it a, a business of startup. So we've, we've tried a bunch of different businesses with that. Um, for a while, we were doing shared office space because we had to move offices. Um, and when we did, we're like, well, why don't we just get a bigger office and rent part of it out and you know at the time in the philippines it was 99 percent occupancy so you know it was really good but then when COVID hit obviously that changed the business entirely so we had to pivot that part of the business into something else um and you know we're, we're in the middle of kind of pivoting that right now but um and you know now we're doing a bunch of different things um you know we, we like to dabble uh, into different businesses and seeing what works um, another thing that we do there is uh, we help startups, um, and if they need HR services, if they need uh, IT support, if they need uh, accounting support, legal support, um, that's stuff that we can help uh, businesses in as well. Because originally it was like, we can get to the space, and if you need help with any other infrastructure stuff, so you don't have to worry about yourself, that's stuff we can offer you as well. Um, we've got a team that develops 
apps. Uh, we've got, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking into getting into other industries like uh, cosmetic uh, surgery and, and medical websites. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we've got, and what's nice with our business is, you know, if someone's got a good enough idea um, and they, they're willing to put the time and effort into it, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a solid plan, uh, we'll support them and we'll help them kind of make it happen. Um, like this medical thing that we're getting into, we actually have uh, a guy who came from that industry and has been wanting to do it for a while. And, you know, it's about to come to fruition um, over this year is we're going to get um, start selling medical websites. Wow. And you guys have all the resources to support them. I mean, I'm here in yeah. office space, HR yeah. on top of the programming and design and all the yeah. things that have made agent image so successful uh and like with agent image being able to own a space where medical pharmaceutical being able to have success there build your portfolio and then using right. that to attract high quality cl clients within that vertical within that industry right right, right. i was in a i was in a um oh gosh what's that app um clubhouse one yes. day and then someone was saying you know, because uh, I'm sure everybody's on Instagram, right? And, and, and in Instagram, all those, you know, mentors or people who give business advice, like, oh, you have to, you know, have multiple sources of, of revenue, right? And what was interesting that somebody said, and we had been doing, I, I didn't realize that that's what we did. It's like, you don't just start an entirely brand new business as a different source of revenue, right? You kind of you, utilize what you've got and build on that. And so that's what we did. Everything that we was successful for us, we used that to build other stuff, right? So the outsourcing we were doing it for ourselves, and it's our business. Now we can outsource to other people, right? And you know, we're building an app for ourselves. Great. Now we can start building that app for other people. We can, you know, uh, we've got office space, and we've been kind of doing that. We were in the real estate space, so it's an easy kind of. Um, way to kind of set that up as well so we've just been building on what we already have uh in the philippines we have uh, like we have like 300 people now in the philippines so um we've got a, a lot of resources out there um to help us kind of build and, and um, create new things and you know hopefully make a lot of successful products that, that make people happy makes sense and i love the quote utilize what you got and build on that that uh, is definitely powerful. We, we've done that internally at our agency to an extent where ad tech, advertising, uh, algorithms was really our thing. We added content marketing funnels because we saw the need. We had clients that were earlier stage. Their ads were not converting as well. We would build that out. We then found some groups didn't have a marketing plan, a marketing strategy, added that. And then uh, lastly, around outreach and going after some strategic partners in that fashion. And then, you know, sub, you know, products underneath that with creative right. and different types right. of design. But like you said, we didn't just start from scratch and say, hey, we're a content marketing agency. We were able to leverage the traffic and build off of that. Exactly. And that's that's how you get your different sources of revenue, right? And that's how you diversify your business um, mm -hmm. and make things interesting too, right? I mean, I know uh, how many years you guys have been around, but after a while, doing the same thing over and over again can get... Yeah, you know, it can, you know, you need a little stimulation trying to do different things and get that excitement again of like starting something new um, to keep you kind of you know, motivated and interested. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things that are happening with Agent Image alone, um, but, you know, it's also, also nice to see, especially as we're getting older, you know, other people um, kind of starting things and other people being the ones that's like, hey, let's let's try this or know let's let's do this or can i be the person that manages this and i think that's kind of the second part of kind of you know where, where i'm personally headed is really kind of more in the mentorship side of things and helping people grow um with their careers and become better leaders and become better performers um because if you know again for me obviously the company is amazing and um, but the bigger legacy for me is really the people and making sure that our people grow and learn and become successful and make an impact, uh, you know, not only with our business, but with our clients as well. Sure. Yeah, I've been able to see it. We've been doing this for seven years now, you know, not since 99 or 2002. Yeah. So definitely. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, even being able to see leadership within our team grow and uh, a media buyer overseeing an entire department, including creative and you know junior media buyers and promoting them as they get to higher levels of performance uh, and better skill sets. So uh, that is uh, really fulfilling, I imagine, and being able to, I mean, for us, we've noticed as well, each new product we build, each new piece of revenue supports uh, the prior. It, it's the complementary mm -hmm. in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the content marketing funnel makes the advertising traffic uh, perform at higher levels. I imagine it's the same for your services. And for us, a lot of it's been around investor acquisition. So equity crowdfunding, raising capital. We found fundraising to be a common theme, a common initiative around our groups. We could then work with them post uh, fundraising on their marketing milestones or even on their second, third. One of our clients is on their fourth fundraising wow. round. So yeah. really hearing where the audience takes you, really understanding where you're able to contribute the most value has been a uh, key for us. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, seven years ain't no joke, man. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, you know, for obviously there are probably a lot of entrepreneurs that, that are hearing this. I, I, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins and, you know, he said it and I, you know, I can't quote him directly, but every year you're, you're in business, it gets harder, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't get uh, easier. And, um, you know, that you're kind of a gladiator, uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, trying to make things happen, make things work with the resources you have, dealing with HR issues, dealing with, whatever whatever happens you know to you that day so uh, oh yeah props to you guys thanks i appreciate that i actually did unleash the power within a tony nice. robbins course in 2017 and i remember he, he showed his cell phone and said anytime i look at this with over a thousand employees someone's messing up <laughs> and to your point <laughs> and to your point of the larger you get the harder it gets you know a new set of problems you hit new goals right. Uh, but I, I started realizing, realizing that with our client volumes years back when we were at 15 to 30 and 30 to 50. At any given time, a few of those clients, their campaigns were not going well. Uh, other clients were ecstatic with the results. And then a lot in between. I noticed they would switch one month of the low client would be overperforming and vice versa. Uh, but there were you know different exercises I had to do for management so that we could really focus on the creativity and not be taken back too much when those type of communications emerged. Right, right. Cool. Yeah. Now, you know, I want to get into some recommendations for founders. You guys have, you know, obviously tried a lot of stuff to get where you're at, a lot of different tactics, a lot of strategies. What type of tests could you recommend uh, for anyone listening in and what they could do for their own business, for marketing or overall growth? For overall growth, um, you know, I'm, I'm really heavy into mentorship and, and leadership training right now. And I think the number one thing, or there are two things that I would recommend and, and two things I recommend to any of my friends who have businesses or who are starting a business. I think one of the things that you have to be clear with um, is what your why is. Well, why, why do you wake up every morning? Why do you start this business? Why do you do what you do? Um, Simon Sinek has a great book, yep. Start With Why, right? And um, if you actually, if you just, I, and I send this video to anybody that I I, I, uh, I mentor, is just, you know, watch a video. It's, it's a short version of the book. But the moment you're clear with your why, right? And um, the exercise you go through with people is, you know, what's your mission, vision, and core values? And not just the, you know, the overly wordy, no meaning, mission, vision, and core values. It's like, what, what's important to you, right? And, um, you know, the moment you key in on that, um, the easier I think it is to start making decisions on what you should and should not be doing, right? Who you should and shouldn't be making part of the team or what products you should be doing. Because when you're in alignment with your why, um, stuff becomes much easier and stuff becomes much clearer. When you're not clear on your why and your core values, um, you'll feel stressed and conflicted and you just won't, don't understand why, like, why is it, you know, why doesn't it feel right? Right. And usually it's in conflict with those. And I think that's the number one of the first things that I would recommend to any business owner, um, figure out what your personal ones are, like your personal mission. And then once you have that, you're like, oh, okay, then 
it's easier to figure out what your what your business's mission is, mm -hmm. right? Because it's it's essentially the same thing, but it's just geared more towards you know your business, right? And if you're in alignment with with your mission and vision, and you're adding value, um, the money's going to roll in. Things are going to work out, right? You're going to attract the right people. Um, you're going to be doing the right things, hopefully, right? Because you're so clear with what you want. You're so clear with with, with what's important to you. Um, that stuff kind of um, grows in. So the second thing that I would recommend for any business owner, um, really focus on hiring well. Um, if you do a good job in hiring, um, you can solve a lot of problems that you could potentially experience way upstream, right? Um, there's a book that someone recommended to me that I kind of, uh, it's kind of my Bible when it comes to hiring. It's called uh, Top Grading. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of that book, but it, um, it's a, you know, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a snoozer first couple chapters, but the, um, the concepts are fantastic, right? And I, I didn't use the exact system, but I used the concepts um, for all my hiring. And anybody that who's a leader in a company or anybody who's got their own com um, their own company or is an entrepreneur, if they're very if they if, if that's kind of one of the key skills um, to be very successful, it's like doing a good job at hiring, right? Um, in the book, it says that in any typical company, twenty percent of the people that are on your team are A players, and everybody else is a B, C, or worse player. So that's you know one fifth. Right. Or, uh, yeah, that's one fifth of your team. Right. And, yeah. and so the exercise goes, you know, when I, when I do this, I was like, okay, well now imagine if 80%. So I ask people name those people that are a players in your company. And they'll say, well, it's this person, this person. I say, like, okay, now imagine if you had, if 80% of your team was those two people were exactly like them, how would your team be run? Right. How would you what would you be talking about? We very different conversations. Right. It wouldn't the HR issues would be almost non-existent. Right. So what you have to do is you have to squeeze real hard from the beginning um, during the interview process and the, the vetting process so that when they get into your company, you don't have to be like oh, four months later, like, oh, man, you made a gigantic mistake. Right. And um, so, you know, in in a nutshell, most you know, most people when they hire, they do skill first, personality second, culture third. It should be reverse. It should be culture first, personality second, skill third. And the example that uh, I tell people when I'm, I'm working with them or I'm coaching or mentoring them is like, okay, have you ever been at a job where they hired somebody that looks good on paper was a, but was a total jerk, right? <laughs> they destroy the team. Right. They, th this guy can be like the best programmer or the best salesperson or the best whatever. But if he's a, if he's a jerk and doesn't share your common core values, it's it's going to be wasted effort and he's going to destroy the rest of the team. Right. But have you ever worked, uh, you know, been at a job where they hired somebody didn't have quite the skill set, but fit really well within the culture and the group. Right. They usually slide right in, do very well is very supported by the team and the, the team gets elevated, right? Versus the other guy, the team just kind of falls apart, right? And then you start seeing factions and stuff like that. So the goal for any leader is to really be, to educate yourself to be a better um, uh, recruiter so that you can get the, the right people into your company so that you don't have to worry about those crazy problems six months, seven months, eight months down the line, right? And then you just have to fire that person and find somebody else. If you do a better job in the beginning, your company will grow significantly, right? And uh, I beta tested um, that entire system uh, with our sales team uh, a couple of years ago. And the three people I hired, and I must have, so now when, when it's an important job, I'm the person who does a phone interview. I'm the person who looks through the resumes. Because that's how important it is for me. Um, because if you do a good job there, the rest becomes easy, right? The rest becomes like execution, right? And how do we do this, right? You bring the right people into your company, 
um, your company can grow and flourish and be very, very successful. And that person can also grow and flourish and be very, very successful. So, yeah, I think that's one of the things that, you know, top two things, be clear on your, your mission, vision and core values and be very good uh, and be, be very involved with the hiring process because you get that right. Um, you, you definitely solve a lot of problems down the line. What's your why and hire well and be a, a better recruiter. Yeah. And that doesn't always get brought up on this show. And I think it's such a great point that you make. It's like you said, you get that part dialed from there. It's just execution. And you have these team members who are set up for it. It's particularly insightful to me because of everything that you guys do with, with your success at agent image, of course, and your positioning as a, you know, the top tier group in that vertical of real estate but also you're building teams with August 99. So understanding the right fit for the right client and how they're going to be able to scale from there. So uh, that's what I'm, you know, what's in the background for me as you're talking about it is these are the functions used for these successful teams that you're, you're building on an everyday basis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and you know this, right? When you find this yeah. hire, that's just like, they're the best, right? You're just like, man, I wish I had 20 of you. You can, right? If you knew what you were doing when you're when you're hiring, right? Instead of lucking into it, just like, oh, you just happen to get this amazing person. You're in, you're you're more in. Um, you do things with more intent when you hire. Then you then you can get more of those people into your team. And if you have more of those people in the team, the conversation becomes very different. Right, the, sure. the the direction becomes very different. The problems are very different. It, it's it's more of okay, how do we do this together? How do we kind of do all this stuff, right? And, and uh, yeah, I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, we're not perfect by any means, right? But um, of course, but you know, it, it's one of the most important things, and that's one of the things I, I recommend to any any leader, any business owner, or anybody who's just like a head, a head of their division or team or whatever. It's like do a good job at hiring your your headaches will disappear. Your old headaches will disappear. It'll be a very different uh, conversation in, in a few months. It's like you said, you can't be perfect, but if 80% are the A players, it right. is, you know, transformational. And just, just a quick touch on, what, what's the big distinction between personality and culture? Just because yeah. I know there's some similarities there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they can overlap, right? Um, but if, you, again, the first exercise is, really identifying your culture right so like somebody you know everybody has seen this movie wolf of wall street right a person that will work well for that guy's business will not work well for my business right and an a player there is a very different from a player in in my business right so if you're very clear with what you who you are right who you are what your core values are what your company's core values are then, then you can identify the, the right A player for kind of for your, for your business. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's beyond their individual personality and the culture, how it matches right. up with the culture of your business. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then, and then, yeah. so like, so there's culture, right? And that's that's what I, I'm defining as culture. Now, personality wise, right? People work differently right they they they, um, they succeed in different environments and they they like some people like places that you know they where there's a lot of humor and cracking jokes or they they like and so some people like working alone and some people like working in groups right and you have to start identifying whether they're going to be a good fit for that group um, personality wise otherwise you know if you brought an introvert to the wolf of wall street's company they would never be successful Right. You yeah. have to get somebody that would fit within that culture. Right. And and for, you know, for anybody's business, that, that's where you have to take a, a long, hard look at like, OK, this is our culture as a company. This specific position in this specific department with this specific manager, are they going to fit well with that person? Right. So, for example, let's say hypothetically you have a department and uh, you know, the manager is a micromanager. Right? That's just his style and that's the way he does it. Maybe he's successful doing that great. Right? And you interview somebody and they're like, Yeah, I hate micromanagers. The probability of that person fitting with that with that with that manager is is very slim, right? Obviously you'd have no. to interview a little bit more just to get like just to figure out, okay, what do you mean by you don't like being micromanaged? 
or you're forthright with them and say, hey, this person is a micromanager, but this is how he does it. Do you think you'd be comfortable with that, right? Because mm-hmm. you want them to be successful, right? Part of part exactly. Of, you know, because if, if if your people are successful and they're happy and they're and they're flourishing, your company is going to be happy and flourishing, right? And like I said, that's where you, that's the first gate, right? That and you have to be like the stand guard at that gate, right? When you let people into your business, you have to know that they're going to be a good fit and they're going to help. Um, they're going to be successful and they're going to help your business become successful. And that's why it's so, so important um, that, that entrepreneurs are, are very cognizant of, of who and what they are. I had a friend that I was coaching. Um, he has a, a chiropractic practice. And we went through the same exercise. And he's like, oh, man. You know, it's like, I think I got to fire some people. Right? Because he was, he was like, <laughs> it, it just occurred to him. He's like, my core values are very different from this other person's core values. And we're going to have to we're going to have to change that up. And, and fortunately, they work things through. But if you're clear with your core values, you know, part of your job as a as a leader is to to set expectations, right? Like, this is how you deal with the client, right? This is if there's a pissed off client that you got to deal with, this is how you handle it, right? And it's easier to give those instructions if someone shares the same values as you. If someone's value is like, I want to help the client as much as possible provide the greatest customer service and make them feel better after our conversation and that's in alignment with what you're trying to do whenever you deal with clients then that's it's an easy it's easy right managing that person is easy right because this is what i want great that's in line with what i want cool then you just you can just kind of do it right and then then it's a, it's a execution at that point mm-hmm. it's uh, it's well said And it's tough at times because I've had different team members, like a right brain, left brain scenario where they work well together, but their personalities are different, Uh, but they're committed to the result and there's that synergy. But it's like you said, you have that gatekeeper and you make sure you're not letting the wrong people in because at least for my business, it sounds like it's the same. The team is the product. Uh, You know, the, the client is buying a result, but we explain how the product gets them there so uh these are good points to emphasize what about optimization what happens when you're bringing in team members and you're not seeing something work out it's not leading towards growth maybe it's doing the opposite uh or you're just looking to you know really refine it what uh what are the best ways to revisit this you guys have obviously been through many chapters with your business what's the uh, best approach for optimization um so what i would do um, is really, you know, and I mentioned it earlier, one of the most important roles that a leader or entrepreneur has in the company is setting the right expectations, right? Um, you know, there is a time in the business that, that things were very challenging and people weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And like, you know, I had to go to the Philippines for you know, a couple of months at a time to, to kind of to fix things. And there was one night I was in the hotel room and I just had this epiphany. And I was like, did I tell them how things were supposed to be done? Right? Or am I, was I expecting them to do something that nobody ever told them, like, hey, this is how you're supposed to do it. Right? And the answer that, I, the conclusion I came was like, no, I did not. Right? I wasn't explicit with what, how they were supposed to do things. Right? So one of the first books that I ever bought uh, you know, when we started the business was uh, the dummy's guide to being a good manager. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but the one takeaway I took from, from that, uh, from that book. And this is what I tell a lot of people I mentor is like, everybody wants to do a good job, right? You have to make that assumption that everybody wants to do a good job. What your role as a leader or manager is, is to tell them what a good job is, right? Because if you don't, they'll be they'll they'll be chugging along, doing this thing, thinking, "Oh, I'm doing such a great job," and then you come back, you're like, "Oh, you're doing a terrible job," but it's your fault because you never told them what a good job is. Does that make sense? And like, so the first thing you have to do as a leader is really set those expectations. Be very clear, like, literally explicit, right? Like, you have to do this. You have to call this client at this time. You have to answer this way. And the more explicit you are, then at that point, and then they choose to do otherwise, which most people don't, 
to be honest, right? If you do a good job hiring in the beginning, you set the expectations, people are going to rise to the occasion and do a good job, right? And and that's at least from my experience. It's like everybody I know, I know you want to do a good job. So this is this is how to do it, and that's what you should be really doing as a uh, as a as an owner or as a as a manager. It's like, you know, just optimize their their potential is to really say, hey, this is this is what you need to do, and these are my expectations of you, and this is how you can help grow the business, and this is where you where you fit, right? And this is if you do this, this is this is the big picture, right? And that's how and optimizing somebody is really you know, you, if you did a good job hiring, you know what their skill set is and you know what they're good at and you know they're going to be a good fit. You tell them, you tell them like, hey, this is this is my expectation of you and this is what you need to do to kind of to bring the best out of you. And if they're in alignment and if you did a good job in the beginning, should they should be they should be successful, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that's that's the hope at least. Sure. I like to use the word measurable. Being able to define sure. with that team member what measurable success looks like. Uh, sure. Not that everything is, you know, ones and zeros, but that it's, uh, you know, into, you know, it, it's very clear. This is what success looks like in this role. And like you said, without really telling them what a good job is, their perspective may be, hey, I'm showing up on time. I'm getting my stuff done. Great right. job. Meanwhile, you're trying to measure, measure client satisfaction, uh, shareability of the product at the end, and maybe using the success of that uh, piece of work as a marketing tool it's itself. So if you're thinking this way, team members thinking another, there could be a huge discrepancy. Correct. But for me, uh, and again, this I may be different from other people, right? But KPIs for me are a byproduct. Okay. Right? Um, if you have, for example, if you say, you know what, your goal here, if it's a customer service person, right? Your goal here is when somebody's on the phone with you, they're in a better place after they get off the phone with you, right? You really try to address their needs and put them in a better emotional state, something like that, right? If, if that's kind of your core value, the KPI should kind of take care of themselves is kind of my belief, right? If if they share the same values as you and they understand the vision and they understand kind of what you're trying to accomplish, the KPI should be easy to achieve, um, mm-hmm. you know, as long as they're realistic and as long as they're in line really with your, your business mission and vision. Um, but yeah, so KPIs, it's, I, I believe in them. I, I think it's great. Um, but, you know, I think if, if you get people involved with the bigger picture of what you're really trying to accomplish and why you're measuring these KPIs, um, like I said, hopefully they'll, they'll rise to the occasion and kind of achieve those KPIs with their eyes closed because they understand what the bigger picture is, right? It's not the, no, yeah. like for sales guys, it's not the amount of phone, phone calls really, right? It's really, you know, you want to hopefully, pr- you know, provide a, a good service or product to clients, and really improve their lives or improve their business, right? If, if people see the big picture, it's like, okay, great. You should be making X amount of calls. You should be selling X amount, right? And that's kind of, those are the metrics, but the big picture is you should be seeing this. And sure. Yeah, so. And if KPIs aren't being reached, it's usually something like you mentioned uh, about the overall setup, about the purpose, about their understanding of what they're doing and how they should be leaving the other side. Um, right. What about scale? What have been the key elements to your business's scalability or just consistent factors you've seen across the board? You know, scale, uh, obviously, and I don't know if other people, and you've talked to a lot of other businesses, right? Um, scaling can be difficult. You know, I, I think from a philosophical level, you know, every stage of your business will require a different you. And I feel like that's kind of a meme that goes around in IG, but it's true, right? Like you have to grow. Um, I'm a big fan of this book, um, the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. And one of the laws is the law of the lid. And what it states is that, um, everybody underneath a leader will only be as good as that leader. That leader essentially becomes the lid, right? And so for your teams to grow, you have to grow as well. Right? So part of being, of scaling is constantly growing as an individual, um, constantly learning and, and constantly just, just scaling kind of 
you and yourself and, and what you know, that, that'll help us uh, significantly. Because, you know, scaling is, there's a lot of issues, and a lot of problems that you run into, you know, for every, you know, when you hit your million dollars, when you hit your $5 million, when you hit your $10 million, it's, it's going to require a different you. Um, and it's going to require a different you and a different group to help kind of solve problems. And scaling is essentially that. It's really like, okay, well, how do we deal with these new sets of problems, you know, in a magnitude of 10, which is very different. And generally, at least this, that had been the experience with us, you know, the decisions you made when you were 19 people sometimes come back to haunt you when you're 50 people and 60 people. And you're like, oh, yeah, that one decision that I thought was inconsequential. Uh, now we have to fix all this stuff, right? And that, that stuff happens. And, and you're nodding your head because I'm assuming that's happened to you, right? Oh, yeah. Right? And, and like, some people think of scale from the very beginning, right? And, um, you know, us, we were, you know, school of hard knocks. We were just kids when we started the business. And, you know, um, learning to scale is like, you're just like, oh, maybe we should have done this other thing. <laughs> you know? And, um, but I think as a general kind of thing it's like you know there's there's no way for you to understand what you're walking yourself into unless of course you've got like a b board members if you've got people on your team it's like oh yeah i know exactly what you guys did and this is how, how to do it but you know it's always going to be some challenge it's always going to be and the way we're solving you know scale or we're trying to solve scale obviously one is technology right you know what can what can you set up and automate um you know so that things become easier right the other thing is you know improving processes so that you become more efficient right that's another thing uh, another thing is okay training and hiring and you know all all these kind of very fundamental things but you know when you're trying to squeeze more out of you know uh, the company and, and more efficiency and stuff like that you're going to be looking at all those things and it's going to be very different uh, for very different businesses like for example a scaling a restaurant is very different from scaling uh, an app company, right? Like Instagram, I don't know, they were like 10 people, 13 people, right? But they were built to scale. Us, uh, specifically, we're, we're partially service and partially product. So scaling for us is a little bit different because, you know, we have to have more people, right? The bigger we get, the more people we have to have. But now we're like, okay, well, what if we look at other, you know, other ventures where part of it, we don't have to have as many people and it's more technology and, you know, how do we do these things so we become more efficient and, you know, um, so as a general thing, it's like, you know, um, the leaders and the owners and the managers, they just have to be able to cope and grow with, with the growth and they have to be able to be dynamic enough um, to, to make decisions so that you can scale um, uh, with the company and, and you know, rise up to the challenges that, that growth kind of brings. It really comes from that personal growth because your team is going to be at these different levels and yeah. to be dynamic enough and move with the industry, move with the business, be able to tell what the right direction for your business is. Like you mentioned, it may not be more people. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, you know, more customized product, more margins, smaller number that allows you to grow as a business could be a lot of different factors, but really being listening for that as part of your own growth. Right. And, you know, I, I think, and part of it, keeping in line with your mission, right? Like, and, and I go back to that, like, if you're very clear on your mission and your vision and your core values, those decisions to help scale should be clear because they're like, well, you know, I want to provide this amazing service then maybe our growth shouldn't be so quick because we should, we want to keep, you know, the quality very, you know, really good. Right. And, and that's how we're going to scale. We're not going to scale super quick or, you know, maybe we, we do a, a slight pivot with our product line so that, you know, we can do what we love to do, which is in very high margin, but we've got this other business or this other product that's bringing us high margin that keeps the lights on. Right. And that we've actually done that for ourselves. You know, we, we made some of those decisions on our end. Yeah, and these are crucial things to point out because when we're working with founders, they're often asking us, 
how do we scale? How do we run at this level and then ramp up our ad budget to that level? So without putting these pieces of the puzzle together, could be missing uh, a lot of things that were uh, you know, consistent with your mission versus uh, just looking to hit bigger numbers as a whole. And uh, kind of like you're giving that example of 19 people and scaling your staff to 50, it often becomes an issue down the line, not immediately after an action's taken. Right, exactly. And it, it just depends, right? It depends on what, and, and hopefully your vision is, you know, or hopefully people's goals. And, and this is, again, this is something that I, 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 I coach people is like, money should just be a byproduct, right? Kind of, and I, it's the same thing with the KPIs. It's like, if you're, if you're really adding value, and again, this is a Tony Robbins thing, if you're really adding a lot of value to people, the money's going to come, right? And, you know, the focus, in my opinion, shouldn't be like, oh, let's just try to make as much money as possible. It should be really, okay, how do we grow the business so we can, you know, we can provide our, our mission, right, at a higher scale uh, in an efficient and effective way. And then if you do that, if that's what you focus on, then the money's going to come. Right, then, then your scale is going to come, and then you reinvest back into the business. And, and we're a privately held company, so everything you know, we, we reinvest a lot of what we earn back into the business, and just just kind of grow with that, and, and you know, focus on focus on adding value. Don't don't focus on on just you know, we're going to make ten million dollars or whatever, right? Because that ten million dollars or whatever money that is that you, you're trying to earn, that's going to come if you if you're doing the right thing, hiring the right people really you know true to your mission of of adding value in, in whatever meaningful way that is and you know I'm, I'm, I'm a true believer in that that that's you know it starts there um first likewise yeah likewise i was taught uh business is the monetization of value so focusing on delivering that value uh your mission at a higher scale in a more efficient way absolutely i i could see why you're coaching because of uh, you know all the knowledge that you're able to share here for doing this for the past couple decades, and uh, Luigi, just as we're wrapping the episode here, wanted to ask: Are there any closing notes? I mean, there's already so many uh, you know good quotes, you know different books you've recommended. Any closing thoughts you want to leave listeners with? Um, I think you know, I, I think we just got to go back to your why, right? Um, because that's going to pull you through all the challenges that you're going to you're going to go through, and you're going to go through challenges. I mean, seven years you've been in business a long time. I mean, if Jason, if I were to ask you, you know, why do you do what you do, and if you can tell me in one sentence, would, what would you say? You know, the one sentence exercise I haven't done for our why, uh, but it's essentially because we saw flaws in. Uh, early stage marketing and early stage fundraising. We we built this agency to be the group that we wanted to work with uh, to create right. a more effective, more consistent process. Now right. I could probably break down those words and do it in a quicker window, but that that yeah. is our why. Right, and you basically wanted to help businesses, right? Um, because maybe it didn't exist, and you wanted to help them become successful, right? And I'm assuming when you see people become very successful uh, because of stuff that you did, that, may, that must make you feel super happy, right? And if you focus on that, if people focus on, on that all the time, because you're going to run into, uh, you know, some HR problem or some, you know, some, some technical problem or whatever, but you're going to constantly have to remind yourself, like, this is why we're doing what we're doing. We're going we're gonna to make it past these other issues. We're going to make it past these these HR issues. We're going to make it past losing this client. We're going to make it past you know, this outage with our, with our servers or whatever. That stuff's going to happen. But yes. if, if what you're doing is like every day, I'm really helping people out. I'm really helping mm -hmm. this person get funding so that they can really grow their business and they really can, really can achieve their dream. Then, you know, the days become much easier and it reminds you of, of why you did it in the first place. And I think that's the most important thing. So, you know, that's a great book. Start with why. And, you know, I would read it and hopefully it inspires people or re-inspires people because, you know, every year in business, sometimes you get burned out, right? And sometimes you, you get beat up and sometimes it becomes challenging. Reconnect with your why. And if you do that, uh, I think, you know, things will become much clearer for you. 
Absolutely. I try to think back to those beginnings. Uh, and before this, I was at an ad network working with top 100 advertisers. I was another vendor uh, with 100 other vendors on a spreadsheet and told, good job on this campaign. We'll consider it for the next RFP, the next request for proposal. We're like you said, we're helping people. We're directly part of their growth. It is very exciting. We're on the front line of performance, so when it doesn't work, you know, there's a lot of other pieces that are pulled in that you may not see with a larger corporation at our clients' offices, uh, but that is why it's fulfilling. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to refine this down to one sentence uh, with my team this week. A lot of notes that I'm going to be going over here. Cool. Awesome, man. Oh, uh, yeah. Excellent. That's it. I, think, I think that's it. I appreciate the time. and I appreciate you guys of course. Uh, inviting me to the, to the talk, and hopefully, you know, I get to help somebody out there. Absolutely. Luigi, likewise, we appreciate you taking the time to join. This has been filled with uh, valuable, actionable insights. Uh, last question, if anyone wants to get in contact with you or your company, what is the best way for them to do so? Uh, you know, uh, you can go to agentimage.com um, for our websites for the real estate side of things. Uh, the designpeople.com is kind of our original website. Um, they can email me at luigi at the designpeople.com. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been known to give a piece of advice or two to entrepreneurs. So you can just uh, hit me up and I can help you out. There you go. Look at that uh, welcoming invite. Well, Luigi, thanks again for the time. Thank you, thank you everyone, for listening in today. And we'll see you next time.